One morning when I was a kid, my dad woke me up and said, guess what? I found a water level in Super Mario Brothers. I recorded it with a camcorder to show you what it looked like. Ever since then, I've wanted to record my game footage and moved on to recording through a VCR. I was able to capture fun moments of my childhood, but no matter what I did, the quality was always terrible and never looked like the original game. It's taken years of trial and error, but I think, with the help of many others, I've finally found a cost-effective way to capture these old games on original consoles in RGB. From the moment I started Retro RGB, I always tried to get pictures and video that represent exactly what I was seeing during my testing. At first I used a DSLR and took pictures of my RGB monitor. While not exactly a precise measurement, it did a great job at the time. Of course the end goal was to get into direct RGB capture, but every time I tried I'd run into a ton of problems. It turns out capturing analog signals from a classic console is a complete nightmare and most equipment out there just won't work properly. I wanted to put together both a video and a corresponding section on the webpage to help others with what I've learned. This will be a bit of an advanced video, but if you're a beginner, I'd like to invite you to stay and familiarize yourself, even for future use. For now, here's some quick beginner tips to get you started. If you're just looking to capture game footage from original consoles and don't need it to be absolutely perfect, you have a few good options. First, there's a reasonably priced scaler called the RetroTINK 2X. It, as well as a few other upcoming devices, take retro gaming signals from composite, S-video, and component, and scale it to 480p through HDMI. From there, all you'd need is a capture card that accepts 480p at 60 frames per second, and you could get a great quality capture. Not perfect, but still light years better than what you could have gotten a few years ago for a similar price. Next. There's the FrameMeister, a device with all of the same inputs as the RetroTINK, as well as RGB. It's a much more expensive solution, but when used with Firebrand X's custom profiles, you can get an excellent capture for not much effort. This is actually the most expensive option out there, but as long as you buy a capture card that's known to be compatible, and pretty much all of them are, it may be the easiest way to get great captures. You could also use the OSSC and get a near-perfect picture, but you'll almost surely run into some compatibility issues. Firebrand X also has profiles for the OSSC, but each console will need tweaking via the little LCD, and there's many options that would change for each console. Even if you dial in a perfect signal, you may still run into compatibility issues with capture cards, and you'll get different results with different resolutions. While I absolutely love the OSSC, in the context of dialing in a perfect signal, I'd really consider it more of an expert solution. In my opinion, the method that comes closest to getting a perfect capture is plugging your console directly into a Datapath Vision series of PCI Express capture cards. They require a very specific combination of software and hardware settings, but I, with the help of many others, have been able to get some pretty amazing captures. It's a bit more complicated to set up, but not only has this method gotten me the best quality captures, it's also by far the cheapest. Let's walk through what you'd need, starting with hardware. The Datapath Vision will accept RGB, Component, and VGA from all classic consoles. However, there's a few hurdles to get over. First, in most cases, the Datapath cards require C-Sync at a level that's higher than SCART equipment. This obviously isn't an issue with component video, but if you're using an RGBS solution, you'll almost always require a sync stripper. Next, you'll need at least one low-pass filter in the chain, which is the case anytime you feed an analog signal into a digital device. Some RGB mods, such as ones based off the THS7314 chip, will already have a filter built in, and newer RGB mods might even have the ability to toggle one on or off. In most cases, though, especially with unmodified consoles, you'll need to add a filter in the chain. One easy solution is to use the HD Retrovision component video cables for consoles that are supported. Since they're component video, you don't need to worry about sync, and they have a low-pass filter built in, so interfering shouldn't be an issue. 
All you would need is a cheap RCA to DVI pass-through cable and a coupler, only around $10 of extra equipment. While that's a great solution, I wanted something that supported RGB SCART and was 100% focused on video quality. After quite a bit of research, I worked with an electrical engineer to create the SCART to DVI, an open source device with both a switchable low pass filter and switchable sync stripper that's powered by USB. In my testing so far, this was able to get perfect captures from the console and arcade boards I've tested. It even worked with some consoles that the OSSC had trouble with. Here's how it works. The SCART to DVI connects to your data path card via the DVI's analog pins, the DVI I pins on the side here. Most DVI equipment won't have these, so make sure to get a cable or coupler that includes them. I prefer to use a coupler, as with all analog signals, the longer the distance traveled, the more potential for interference. Unfortunately, all I could find are these long couplers. It's annoying that they don't make small ones like this VGA adapter. If anyone knows where to get a small DVI-I coupler, or knows where they could be made, please let me know in the comments. Anyway, I found that as long as you properly manage the strain relief of the cables, no extra pressure is put on the connector, and it's a safe, secure fit. I've also used short audio and USB cables, both for quality and cable management reasons. When using the device, I recommend starting with both switches off. Almost every console will require the sync stripper on, but it's best to start with it off just in case there's already a sync stripper somewhere else in the chain. I also recommend starting with the low pass filter off for the same reason. If your console mod already has a filter in it, adding a second might soften the image a bit, but it certainly won't hurt anything. From a hardware standpoint, there's not much more to it. This is a simple device designed to get the RGB signal directly from the console into your capture card with the least chance of interference. This isn't just for capturing footage though. Game streamers who are looking for a way to play their game and capture at the same time can use dual output devices like the G-SCART switch to send one output to your monitor and the other to the SCART to DVI. In this scenario, you might want to leave the sync stripper off and utilize the G-SCART's sync regeneration. If dual output is needed, Voltar is currently working on his own similar device that outputs to both SCART and DVI connectors. In fact, Voltar's original pass-through board was the inspiration for this device. I took his board and hacked a THS7374 into it, adding the filter. Voltar's posted this on OSH Park for people that want to make their own, and I also have a verified bomb and pictures on my site. While we were working on the SCART to DVI, we also came up with the Comp to DVI adapter. Basically the same thing, but with component video inputs, and no sync stripper since that's not needed. This is designed for use with the PS2, GameCube, Xbox, or any other 240p or 480i 15kHz signal. It'll technically work with all resolutions, however both of these boards have 9MHz filters that will only help with standard definition signals. This device is completely open source, as is the SCART to DVI, and is available for anyone to download, modify, and manufacture. My hope is that video experts will absolutely pick this thing apart and try to squeeze every bit of quality out of it. I'd love to see a version with a low-pass filter that could be switched to work with all analog resolutions from 240p to 1080p. I'd even like to see a VGA version with a built-in sync stripper for those of us who need RGBS through a D-sub connector. Before we move on to software configuration, I'd like to talk about my experience capturing audio. Basically, almost everything I've tried sucked. Every laptop I tried had some kind of noise, and every desktop motherboard I've used has similar interference as well. I suggest trying the line input of your motherboard just to see if you get a clean capture, but I've only heard captures from one motherboard that were perfect, which is an ASUS model owned by Firebrand X. Basically though, expect bad results. Luckily, Steve from HD Retrovision found a line of inexpensive ASUS audio cards that seemed to work perfect. Both he and I have gotten excellent audio captures with no noise whatsoever. I even asked Firebrand X to install and try one to confirm, and he gives it the thumbs up as well. I really would have liked to see a small USB audio device just for ease of use, but even my high-end music recording equipment had some weird noise on it. 
Certainly not something you'd notice when recording heavy metal guitars, but not acceptable for comparison captures and analysis, because we like to scrutinize every little noise when we do our testing. If anyone knows of a line-in USB device with zero noise, please let me know, but I think the issue might be noise added by the USB bus itself in some cases, so that might not even be possible. Either way, thanks to Stee and Firebrand X for helping to find a good, cheap internal solution. Okay, on to the hard part, configuring the Datapath Vision capture software. I promise after doing it a few times it'll all seem pretty simple, but the first time could definitely be confusing. For beginners, maybe watch this video while following along with the corresponding section on the website. It has links to all the software you need, and if there's any new information or tricks, that page will be kept up to date. Before even opening any software, you'll need to start by determining the exact resolution of the game you're trying to capture. Some consoles like the Genesis will be easy, as all games output at 320 by 256 except for a short list that Firebrand X has compiled on his website. Other console resolutions might be harder to find, so sometimes I just end up loading up an emulator, setting the video to 1 to 1, and taking a screenshot. Then I just reference that resolution. In this example, I'll use a Genesis game that always runs at 320 by 256 just to keep things easier but you'll sometimes run into games that switch between 240p and 480i, as well as games with multiple modes. I'll try and do an advanced version of this video at some point in the future, but for now, let's just stick to the basic one resolution and no changing throughout the same game. So now that you know the resolution, load up the Vision software and get ready for some of the weirdest setup and saving bugs that I've ever seen in any software. I'll get to those in a bit, but just follow this step by step so that you don't accidentally trigger one of these bugs. So first, power on your console and load the game that you're looking to capture. And make sure that when you get to the game, you're actually in a game area, just in case a title screen has a different resolution. Now, in the Vision software, go to Window Input Settings. The first thing you'll want to take note of is the color domain. And if you're using RGB, I usually just leave it at Auto, except if you're using component video, you're going to want to switch this over to YUV. Now hit the reset button and note the resolution over on the left. Now switch over to the window tab and adjust the size to the exact resolution that you found on the input tab. And I know that this isn't a resolution that's being outputted by the Genesis, but it seems to be what the capture card is detecting, so just roll with it. Next, you'll want to check off exclude borders set the capture format to 888, and hit apply. Keep in mind that this is pretty much the only time you're gonna be hitting the apply or okay buttons in this. That's part of the bug I'll demonstrate later. But make sure that all of these settings on the window tab are correct, hit apply, and go back to the input tab. Now we need to determine the horizontal size. And the easiest way to do this is by checking the R3 wiki to see if someone has already calculated this. For Sega Genesis 320 resolution games, it's already been determined that the exact H size required is 427.5. Unfortunately, the Vision software has to round up to single numbers, which sometimes makes perfect configuration impossible. So now that we know that the H size for this game is going to be 427, you're just going to move the horizontal position slider until the game perfectly fills the window and is centered. 85 was right for me, but it might be slightly different for your game. Then just set the vertical position to wherever it looks good. I usually leave it on 11 or 12. You could try messing with some of the other settings like cropping, but to be honest, I like to do all that stuff in post and really don't touch any other settings in this window. Now we have to determine phase, which is the thing that's going to be different every single time you do this. So things like finding the H size, dialing in all the other settings, that's going to be second nature by the third time you do this and super easy, but phase will always be a pain. Different consoles, different filter settings, heck, even toggling the low pass filter or sync stripper on some of the pass through devices will affect phase. So you should always count on tweaking it every time you're ready to get a good capture. By far the easiest way to dial in phase is by loading up a checkerboard pattern. You could then just move the face slider until there's no noise on either side of the screen. Sometimes there's no perfect position though, and I assume that has to do with the fact that the datapath card only adjusts one single number at a time and no decimal places. 
In those cases, just try to get it as good as possible, but you'll probably end up with a little bit of noise on the left and right sides of the screen and nothing in the middle. If you don't have the ability to load a checkerboard pattern, or if you really want a perfect, perfect capture, after you're done calibrating, try to find a screen in the game that you're looking to capture with lines on it and see if you could dial it in that way. One trick I use is using the Windows magnifier. After you've loaded the magnifier, make sure that you uncheck smooth edges or the image won't look right. And in fact, it'll look like some of those terrible filters you see in emulators. Also, I suggest the docked view just to make things a little bit easier to manage. Now hover your mouse over the vision window with the magnifier loaded and dial in the phase until there's no noise on the screen. One trick I like to do is click on the arrow next to the phase slider and then use the arrow keys on my keyboard to move the phase back and forth while hovering the mouse over the window. That way I could adjust the phase while scanning over the image and really be able to dial in something that's perfect. Sometimes I really get anal with this stuff and do this with a checkerboard and then verify in game just to make sure there's no noise anywhere on the game screen. So now that everything's dialed in, prepare yourself for one of the weirdest bugs I've ever seen in any software. In order to save these settings, you first need to hit cancel, then no. Seriously, I, I can't even understand why there's a bug like this that's been left in many, many revisions of the Vision software, but if you hit apply or okay, all of the changes that you just made will disappear, and if you go back into the settings, they're all messed up. In order to save the settings, once again, you have to hit cancel, and then no, you don't wish to undo the changes. Now, technically you could save these settings to a file, but I've had really bad luck with that. And overall, I find that just referencing the settings from the R3 wiki, and of course, if you have settings that aren't up there yet, please contribute. But honestly, just firing up that wiki, reading the settings off for everything else, confirming the horizontal position, and setting the phase takes less than a minute from me now. And I realize it seems a lot longer than that, especially when going step by step through this video. But in all honesty, I really find this to be a very easy thing to dial in. And the only thing that sometimes takes more than a second or two is just making sure to get the phase right. So now that I've shown how to perfectly calibrate your capture card to the signal being fed to it, let's show what you could do with this signal. The focus of this video is mainly going to be about getting one-to-one -one captures and what you could do with them but I'd like to at least briefly talk about streaming. Now, I'm nowhere near a professional streamer, and there's some people out there with some amazing rigs that do some very cool tricks, but I at least wanted to show some of the basics, as well as a cool trick Dark Airy showed me. Now, it would make sense to use software like OBS or XSplit to directly talk to the capture card, and if you're an expert and you know what you're doing and know exactly what settings to change, this might be good for you, but the trick that Dark Ares taught me was just capture the vision window. And it's weird, because while that seems so simple, I would have never thought of that. You've just set that window to be the exact size and perfect calibration for the signal, so why not capture that leave all the settings on the vision side and not bother changing the settings on OBS, and then just make sure to integer scale that in the OBS window. Then from there, just crop out the parts you don't need, and there you go. You have a perfect captured signal that's outputting exactly what you just calibrated. I thought that was a really neat trick and definitely something I wanted to mention, but I'm honestly not gonna go any farther than this because I could dedicate an hours long video just to showing all of the amazing tricks some of my friends have shown me for their streaming rigs. So I'll leave the streaming stuff to the experts and now let's move on to video capture. The software that I like to use for video capture is a newer version of Amarec. Which is kind of funny because when I first discovered that software, I thought it was the most confusing and convoluted thing on the planet. But in all honesty, once you set up the initial settings, there's not much else you have to do every time you load it up. The only thing that I noticed is you definitely need to get version 3.1 or higher because I found an older version with a bug that no matter what you set it to would only capture in 30 frames per second. So that's obviously a pretty huge bug. Also, you're gonna to need to install the X264 codec, 
And if you'd like some alternates, you could also install Lagerith or UT Video. But in my testing, X264 seems to be equal in quality, but all the files are a little bit smaller, making things easier to manage. Once you have Amarec and the Codex installed, open up the Amarec TV software. The first thing you might notice is the signal from the Datapath Vision card might be upside down, and that's perfectly normal. Um, you're just going to have to ignore it and use the vision window to do anything that you need to do with the console and just kind of maybe make the Amarec window smaller so it's not as distracting. Now hit the button in the upper left of the Amarec TV window to bring up the different configuration tabs. I'm going to run through each one and only talk about the settings that you'll need to change. Starting on the left in the general tab, make sure you set the path to wherever you want these files recorded. In the Graph 1 Device tab, you'll want to select your capture device, the audio capture device, and then the audio settings. Don't worry about the video format for now, we're going to come back to that part. Just make sure you get the hardware set up correctly. I've seen the audio capture device window mislabel devices before, so if that's the case, just make sure a game is playing with sound coming out and keep selecting a capture device until you hear audio through your speakers. The next tab, Graph 2, might just be for the preview window, and I've never really messed with any of these settings, so I just turn everything off, not a point, disable, or pretty much make sure that it doesn't change anything. Same thing for the Live tab, I just usually keep things unchecked and don't really mess with anything, but once again, I'm pretty sure this is just for what's coming through the Amarec TV window, which we don't really care about. I'm gonna skip the Preset tab, because I've never used that for anything before, but the next tab, the recording tab, is extremely important. First, you're going to want to make sure that the video frame rate is set to 60 frames per second. And then turn off filter processing. I leave everything else unchecked below that. And then over to the right, for audio compressor, I leave that on uncompressed. And I still leave the bit rate at 320, even though because you have uncompressed selected, it's probably not going to use any compression at all. I still like it just to be safe. Next, you're going to want to hit the button to update the codec list and scroll down to X64, which hopefully you've installed. Once that's highlighted, you'll see it in the middle window and you could hit the setting button. That'll bring up the X264 compression settings, and I like to have this at lossless with nothing on. So I have the preset to ultra fast, uh, no tuning, single pass lossless is really the most important one here, as well as checking off virtual dub hack. I'm not really sure why we need that, but I've been told to leave it on, so it seems to be working for me. And pretty much everything else, just have it set the way you see it in the screen here. Um, and I've really had no problems as long as I've had it set this way. So when you're done, hit OK, and then I guess apply on the recording tab again, just to make sure that this setting is saved. That's pretty much it for the settings. You could try to adjust the screenshot settings if you want to use that feature. Uh, and I guess there's some things with hotkeys in advance that might be preference oriented, but I really don't think that anything would affect your captures at this point. So now just hit OK to save and you'll pretty much never have to touch any of the other settings again. So from this point on, what you're going to need to do is what you'll need to do every time you open up Amarec. So now with Amarec loaded, the Datapath Vision software still loaded and still configured, and the game you're looking to capture on the screen, go back into the settings and go back into Graph 1 Device tab. Now you'll just need to select the RGB 24-bit version and you'll need to make sure that the resolution matches exactly what you set in the vision window. For analog captures, I've never had an issue with this. As long as the game is running, whatever was set in vision, provided it's saved properly, will show up here and you just select the RGB 24-bit version and that's it. There's nothing else you need to do. I have seen an issue on HDMI captures where I would need to manually set like 1280 by 720 or something, but since the focus of this is analog, I'm really gonna say that in my experience, this has gone very smoothly. And that's it, just hit okay. So every time you load Amarec, you're gonna need to do it, but it really is that simple. Just open it up, make sure that the resolution that you've set in Vision is the same as you see in Amarec, and you're all set. Now just hit the play button on the Amarec toolbar to start recording your game. If everything's done right, you'll get a one-to-one, pixel-perfect recording of your game, 
And even though you're using an uncompressed format, because you're really only recording in 240p, it's not going to be that big, meaning that you could take your recording and have it archived without worrying about filling up your hard drive space. So now that we have this recording, I want to show you how to scale it properly, both for uploading directly to services like YouTube or for use within your own videos. Now that you have your recording in its original resolution, you can scale it any way you'd like. I prefer to use the software Virtual Dub to do this, and I suggest getting the 32-bit version in case you want to eventually run scripts with this. Once again, we'll probably be using the X264 codec, but Lagarith and UT Video might come in handy, and they're free, so you might as well just install those as well. And you'll need AVI synth if you ever want to do any scripting. I'm not going to go over that in this video, but it's just something to know, and once again, it's free. So now open up Virtual Dub and open up the file that we just captured, the Sega Genesis game with the 320 by 256 resolution. Now in the menu bar, go to Video and Compression and choose whichever you'd like. I recommend using that same X264 format that we used in the previous step, and I also recommend still leaving it uncompressed because I've had some issues where exporting uncompressed worked perfectly, and then I just used Handbrake to compress it later, but trying to add compression at the same time as scaling caused it to crash or give an error. So you're welcome to try whatever you'd like, but in this example, I'm sticking with uncompressed. Now go to Video and Filters, hit Add, and choose Resize. Make sure that the first thing that you select is the nearest neighbor setting from the Filter Mode dropdown, since that's what ensures pixel uniformity when using integer upscaling ratios. For this example, I'm targeting a 4K output resolution. And I'd normally recommend a 9x scale or 900% scale for this scenario. However, the game we're using has a lot of overscan, so I know if we use 10x, we're only going to cut off parts of the screen that aren't really needed and not anything like a life bar or even part of the gameplay window. Just a note, while I'm showing 10x or 1000% in this example, you could do whatever you'd like to fit any resolution you'd like. So 3x or 300 times for 720p, 4 or 5x for 1080p, and it's kind of the same as using the open source scan converter. So as long as you know what those resolutions are, 720p is 1280 by 720, etc., uh, then this step should be easily scalable to whatever resolution you're targeting. Hit OK, and now let's move on to correcting the aspect ratio. I don't want to get too deep into that in this video, but basically what we're capturing are square pixels the same way that any kind of digital device would interpret it. But CRTs didn't do this. CRTs, in fact, didn't use resolution, they used samples per line. So that means that a resolution of 320 would be too wide for a standard 4x3 resolution, and resolutions like 256 would be too narrow. Lucky for us, Steve from HD Retrovision came up with a formula that could be used with these common retro gaming resolutions to make it the same aspect ratio that you would find on a CRT, which at least in my opinion is the goal of these captures. You want to get a pixel perfect look displayed the same way that you would see it on a CRT. And to do this in virtual dub, all you need to do is add a second scaling operation. So you should still have that filter menu up and just hit add it and choose resize one more time. This time you'll want to change the filter mode to Lancos 3, disable the aspect ratio lock, and set the horizontal scale to the recommended setting. Since this is a 320 source, we'll be setting it to 90.2%, leaving the vertical scale at 100%. And once again, if it was a 256 horizontal source, you'd want to scale by 112.75 horizontally, and once again, just 100% by the vertical scale. After that, just hit OK. One step I always like to add is fitting this capture to a standard resolution. If your file is going to immediately go into something like Adobe Premiere or some other video editing software, you could skip this, but I still choose to do this just so that whatever I'm importing into my editing software is exactly a 4K or 1080p resolution. To do this, we'll once again add another resize filter, and the only setting I normally change in this is selecting letterbox crop to size and entering the target resolution. So for this one, it's going to be 3840 by 2160. 
I don't think you need to change the filter mode to anything, but I always leave it at nearest neighbor just in case. Then I just hit OK. For the final edit, just hit the cropping button and then make sure to scale in the timeline to some place in your capture that's going to be the main part. So for this game, I'm just going to scroll forward a little bit until we get to the actual game window. Now, depending what resolution you're trying to scale to, there's two goals that you could be trying to achieve here. If you're doing an overscan like we are, you're going to want to keep cropping until that vertical resolution hits the exact target. Now, the last step that we took would do this automatically, except there are some games where you'd want more cropped off the bottom than the top or vice versa. So for us, it's lucky, it's dead even, um, and that will crop off the part of the game that we don't need and make this a true 4K vertical resolution. If you're having 4X or 9X scales, you would use this slightly different. In that scenario, you would just crop off any parts of the game that have noise, like you saw on the bottom here, and it doesn't really matter what the vertical resolution is because that last step that we just performed will add black bars around the entire image, filling that to the proper resolution. So for this cropping step, you're either chopping off some kind of weird noise that you don't want to see, or you're chopping it down to the target resolution, making sure that you keep whichever part of the game window that you'd like. Now hit OK to both windows and you're back at the main virtual dub screen. Sometimes I like to cut out only the portion of the video I need because when scaling to higher resolutions, these things could get very big. But other than that, there's no other setting that you'd need to worry about. Just go to File and Save as AVI. Once again, just a quick warning, if your target resolution is 4K or if it's just a really long file, this is going to be a very large file. So just make sure you have enough storage space in order to save it. After it's done saving, you'll now have your uncompressed, pixel perfect, aspect ratio corrected image, and in my opinion, they look really awesome. The only other step you might want to add on is compressing, either for going directly up to YouTube or just for archival purposes, and the free software Handbrake is the perfect tool to accomplish this. I found that their presets are generally okay, but for whatever reason, it always tries to automatically crop my images. So the only setting that I would definitely recommend going into is after you loaded your file, go into the Dimensions tab, set the cropping to Custom, uncheck Keep Aspect Ratio, and make sure that the size is the exact target resolution of the original file, and set all of the cropping to zero. I have no idea why it does this. Maybe it detects the black bars on the side or something, but that's really the main thing to worry about, and everything else you could mess with is just preference. One quick note is that I usually use H.264 just because it's a lot faster to compress. If you want a smaller file, H.265 is the same quality and it'll be a smaller file, but it takes a long time, at least on my computer, to compress those files. So it's pretty much your choice, whatever you need, but this is a great tool if you need to compress that uncompressed capture from before. There's one other capture card out there that I think deserves a mention the Epifan DVI to USB 3.0. I own this card and have been able to get captures between 480p and 720p at a full 60 frames per second. This card works with DVI, HDMI, VGA, and component video, all utilizing the full RGB color space. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to get resolutions lower than 480p working properly. And the only way I've seen it done is capturing at a higher resolution because I believe the software could actually double as it's capturing, which kind of defeats the purpose of what I'm trying to do here, original captures of the original resolution. Developer Michael Huth has created both a guide and an alignment tool for the Epifan card, which is pretty cool because as long as you could load up his image file, you could run the automatic setting on the alignment tool to detect everything for you. So no more wondering about H size or phase, it does everything that you need. His original captures are usually of old PCs, which is why it's so easy to load up these uh, image files, and it's also in higher resolutions, not 240p. So someday I hope to get this card working with retro gaming resolutions, and maybe be able to take his image and scale it to each of the resolutions of retro game consoles, thereby making it a tool that you could just load up and use without any configuration. For now though, you should really just stick to resolutions between 480p and 720p, and I would definitely recommend it as a great solution for those. 
So there you have it. This is everything I've learned in the past few years and how I capture, record, and encode all of the files that you've seen in this video. And pretty much everything I do going forward is going to be using this method to make sure that I get the best captures possible. Once again, this video makes all of this look like a lot more work than it really is. This was meant to be thorough and walk anyone with basic skills through what's needed, but I promise you after doing this once or twice, it'll seem like second nature. Really, the only thing that isn't exactly the same every time is the phase setting and the horizontal size settings, and even the H size stuff is all being archived on the R3 wiki. So really, all you need to deal with is making sure that the phase is set correctly, making sure that all of your settings are double checked, and this stuff really is easy. My goal in making this video, as well as the corresponding section on the website, is to help any content creators that need perfect footage from original game consoles. There are many scenarios in which just using emulation footage would be fine and wouldn't take away from the video at all, but for anybody that's doing comparison shots or really requires or just wants original footage from original consoles, using methods like this could vastly improve your videos and I've even seen a few people out there making comparison videos that in their comparisons are talking about artifacts that are a result of the scalers they're using and not the original games, which is a pretty huge mistake for a comparison video. So hopefully with all of this information out there for free, with these hardware designs to interface your consoles to the Datapath video card being open source and available for anyone to use or download, Hopefully all of this will lead everybody on the internet to making better quality videos from their original game captures. At least, that's my hope. I also hope that this video would spark more interest in designing and developing video capture products. Maybe we could make a USB capture card that has all of these old analog inputs that's designed specifically for retro gaming, where we don't have to manually do all of these settings. Who knows, maybe even a software engineer could create a piece of diagnostic tool, kind of like Michael Hoots, but for the data path cards, so all you'd have to do is load up an image and have it auto-detect. Heck, I'd be happy if even if just somebody took the original open source design of these SCART to DVI adapters and improved those. I think the bottom line is we've come a long way in regards to capturing original footage from classic consoles, and while we could now get a near-perfect capture, there's still room for improvement. Well, that's it for this time. I'd like to send a giant thank you to Steve from HD Retrovision for all of his help in getting those formulas together and for all the help in finding horizontal size and all of the really, really technical stuff. I'd also like to thank all of my supporters because without you, none of these videos could happen. And I really hope that I get to do more stuff like this that includes an in-depth section of the website as well as the video. But if you liked what you saw, consider subscribing, or at the very least, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and check out the weekly podcast that keeps you in the loop of everything going on in the retro gaming scene. I hope to see you there.